All right. Um, good morning. Uh, so my name is John Liu. Um, I'm from UCSF uh, Radiation Oncology and Neurosurgery, and I'm happy to represent the, the team led by Dr. Mitch Berger, uh, who couldn't be here to present this um, to you. And I'll be talking about some exciting preclinical tools that we've been developing to both understand and also potentially treat glioblastoma uh, using CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so as this group knows, there's been really an explosion, the amount of genomics data that has been uncovered and, you know, on oncology in general, but, but also certainly in glioblastoma is, you know, the first cancer to be sequenced in depth by the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, I kind of equate the current status of our genomics knowledge as having a, a really high powered flashlight that can shine and look at every mutation, epigenetic change, or even expression profile, but really any tumor we would want to look at. And my interest really lies in the area of functional genomics. This is where we have a tool that can really turn the switch on and off for individual genes or, or um, regulatory elements in a given disease and understand the functional phenotype of that perturbation um, doing that, using that sort of approach. So by way of introduction, you know, I'm sure many people know CRISPR-Cas9 is uh, a bacterial immune system uh, that was discovered many, many decades ago, but uh, it's essentially comprised of a, a nuclease protein, Cas9, and this Cas9 can be programmed to go to different sites in the genome, uh, in an essence, making these double-strand breaks in, in the DNA, and the cell's machinery has to fix those that DNA damage, and this can result in mutations, which you know we as scientists can can uh, exploit to cause uh, targeted mutagenesis and, and study the function of of really any gene we want. And, and this technology has, of course, led to be awarding the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020 to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for the development of um, this method for gene editing. Sort of more topically to more um, you know our, our interest in therapeutics. Um, very excitingly, just two months ago, uh, the FDA approved the first CRISPR-Cas9 therapy for human use. Uh, this is a, um, a product that fixes a particular gene for patients with very severe sickle cell anemia, essentially doing a bone marrow transplant, editing the DNA into those uh, stem cells and putting it back into the patient. So we and others have repurposed the CRISPR-Cas9 as a molecular toolbox to not only make cuts in the genome, but also to fuse uh, the Cas9 nuclease, turn off the cutting activity, and turn it into a molecular switch, so to speak. Um, you can turn on and off gene expression. We can edit the epigenetic status of the, um, of the genome. And this allows us to control not only uh, protein coding genes, but also non-coding RNAs and also enhancer regions, all at genome scale. So the way I think about how we employ these CRISPR tools for glioblastoma in particular, really twofold. Um, one is to use it as a discovery platform, finding therapeutic targets, finding um, sensitizers for standard of care therapies and small molecules. And then the second, which is to use it as a direct therapeutic, in a sense, in essence, gene therapy. So looking at the discovery angle, so one one approach that we've been utilizing very much in my research group is to do these uh, single cell level CRISPR genetic screens. So how this works is that we essentially have a population of GBM cells and we have this library uh, of, of the sgRNAs, which targets uh, one gene at a time in very large scale. And then we can harvest these individual cells and look at the individual cell level, uh, what that perturbation was and, and what that direct consequence was at the transcriptomic level. So um, by comparison to some of these more traditional preclinical assays where you know, you'd have a large scale animal study, you wanna test your agents of interest, you'd have groups of animals, you treat them, and then you, know, you can do whatever fancy next generation sequencing assay or imaging at your disposal. Um, using this method we, that's called perturbsy, we essentially turn the tumor's individual cells as its own experiment. So how this is done is um, using these preclinical models, you know, established intracranial orthotopic xenografts. Uh, we engineer GBM cells to have the CRISPR interference machinery, 
uh, transplant them intracranially and then deliver using uh, a therapeutically tractable tool, convection, enhanced delivery, uh, lentiviral libraries targeting you know, any number of uh, target genes, um, a, a different gene in each of these individual cells. And we can combine on top of that standard of care radiation therapeutics or um, temozolomide, and then let these tumors grow out for some number of time and then harvest the individual cells from these tumors. And then uh, we do single cell RNA sequencing on the resulting tumor cells. And then we can apply mathematical models like linear modeling and manifold analysis to look at um, not only the consequences of gene perturbation, but also the interaction between genetic interference and also uh, treatments such as radiotherapy. So here's an example of one of these experiments. We regenerated a, a xenograft model using the GL661, very common glioblastoma mouse model. And we can recover from a single experiment all the different normal cell types in this tumor, in addition to the uh, the tumor cells, which have the uh, the viruses uh, targeting the, the CRISPR array library. Um, and we can also recover the various cell-cell interactions that are happening in these tumors as well. So as an example of, of one of these experiments, uh, this is a heat map that we've uh, generated from uh, just, a, just a small pool of these animals. And we've targeted 48 different uh, genetic mediators of the radiation response. And, and these were nominated through other CRISPR screens. But as you can see here, we can basically link the genetic perturbation to dozens of transcriptomic phenotypes, such as cytokine activation, uh, mTOR signaling, apoptosis, uh, MIG targets, and see what each of these individual targets do to these pathways. And what we saw was that radiation fundamentally rewires how genetic perturbations affect signaling pathways in GBM. So just to give you an example, here we targeted mTOR. Mind you, this is all pooled in the same tumor. And if you target mTOR, we'd shut off you know, mTOR signaling, we activate um, inflammatory pathways. But if you do this in combination with radiotherapy, you get a much more active and interferon response. You get a much more potent um, repression of cell cycle as well as activation of apoptosis. So that's an example of how we use it for understanding um, discovery and, and finding therapeutic targets and understanding their, their consequences. I do like to talk to you about how we're repurposing these CRISPR tools for potential direct therapeutic. So in thinking about how we can do this uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 as a GBM therapy, uh, we look toward um, what's already been done um, using gene therapy. So, you know, I mentioned the FDA approval of the cas agent a few slides ago, um, and that, that was all done using essentially a bone marrow transplant, um, editing the stem cells uh, outside of the patient um, of course, that's not, um, th while that can be useful for things such as CAR-T therapy, um, we asked whether we could do more of a direct editing of the epigenome. So there is some precedent of this. Um, in 2020, uh, the, the company Editas ran a clinical trial, a very small trial, where they used a CRISPR-Cas9 to correct a mutation that caused congenital blindness in, um, in adults. Um, and they saw some efficacy there, um, but it was really the first demonstration that you could introduce CRISPR-Cas9 into a, into a patient and not just their cells outside of the body. So we asked, you know, could we potentially use this as a therapeutic platform for residual disease and glioblastoma, for instance? So, um, you know, there's one example that my colleagues in the Brain Tumor Center at UCSF recently published was this idea of, of a genome shredding using CRISPR-Cas9. So I mentioned that Cas9 was a nuclease, and you could basically pull it to anywhere in the genome, including non-targeting regions, non-coding regions. And um, this was done using this clever technique whereby um, we essentially tried to find guide RNAs that could target repetitive areas of the genome. And not only that, but specific uh, um, signatures and recurrent GBM, including hypermutated GBMs after temozolomide therapy. The idea is that you could pull the guide RNA and make thousands of different cuts throughout the genome, killing off the tumor cells. So this was shown in vitro to work pretty well. If you introduce this SGCIDE library, you could kill off different kinds of uh, GBM subcultures in, in, uh, in vitro. And furthermore, if you deliver this library into tumors and then you activate the genome shredding after the tumors form, we do see that there is uh, somewhat of a survival benefit uh, for these in vivo as well. Um, I'm also very interested in using CRISPR tools for epigenetic editing. 
Um, so this is uh, showing how we used uh, MGMT as a proof of principle epigenetic target. So as you all know, the methylation status of MGMT is very important as a prognostic and predictive biomarker. Uh, patients with uh, methylated MGMT do better. They respond uh, more, um, uh, more effectively to temozolomide. And this is because methylation of MGMT turns off the MGMT gene expression and temozolomide is able to induce more DNA damage, leading to more glioblastoma cell death. So what we had hypothesized was, could we turn tumors that were MGMT unmethylated and actually make them methylated? And we had the tool to do that. It's called crispr off This is developed by my colleague, James Nunez and Jonathan Weissman's lab. And essentially it turns the, one of the CRISPR-Cas9 variants into a methyl transferase where we can use it to induce site-specific DNA methylation just like the kind you see uh, naturally for patients with methylated MGMT. So as proof of principle, we did these experiments where we electroporated mRNA into tem temozolomide resistant GBM cells. And we saw that in, in uh, cultures, in primary OR derived GBM, as well as um, uh, uh, operating room derived, patient derived organoids, we are able to sustain uh, very strong silencing of the target MGMT gene using this method. And mind you, this is just a transient pulse of a mRNA encoding this system. We saw using targeted bisulfite sequencing that we are able to induce site-specific methylation at the CPG island of MGMT promoter. And when we treated these cells that had been received the crispr off machinery, we saw that there was increased sensitivity to temozolomide. Um, and in many cases, this was actually better than uh, causing a deletion using the Cas9 system. So uh, we're currently using um, lipid nanoparticle strategies to do this uh, in vivo, um, and that's very much ongoing. Um, but in summary, really two flavors of using CRISPR genomics to both understand and treat glioblastoma. Um, I've talked about uh, using these engineered tools uh, to enable genetic screening as a way to find and both understand the consequence of new therapeutic targets in glioblastoma, um, and, uh, you know, we use this in vivo perturb seek method that can be combined with standard of care therapy, and then uh, two different kinds of CRISPR-Cas9 tools, uh, one using this Cas9 nuclease to mediate uh, genome shredding, and then the second using a epigenetic editor to um, induce methylation at regulatory elements uh, that drive glioblastoma. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank um, the many contributors to this project, uh, Dr. Berger, um, who has really been fundamental in this project and as well as my funding source is listed on the right. I'm happy to take questions. That's exciting that you can uh, get that to work in, in the mouse in vivo. I, I actually had a, a question. I think you briefly alluded to it, but it, if you just use CRISPR to cut the gene and, you know, the MGMT, just like uh, delete the gene or somehow... It's, yeah. Cut it. Is that the same as methylating it or what is methylating better than just interfering with it? Yeah. Genome? Yeah. So um, it, in our experiments, we actually compared that head to head and we actually do see uh, more potent silencing and more potent drug sensitization using the methylation editor. And we think this is because when you do a deletion uh, mutagenesis approach, you can get a hypoactive gene product, which is not, um, which is not fully deleted. Got it. That's yeah. interesting. Very. That's a very exciting novel uh, technology that I'm sure will get in, into many other tumor types. So I appreciate your, your exactly. coming to join us today. Thanks so much. Tell Mitch I said hi. Thank you, Dr. Cobbs. All right. I will. Um, I believe our next speaker is Dr. Betty Kim.